by the end of this chapter, you should be able to state the relative advantages of spade, semi-spade, and flap rudders. Identify the forces that act on rudder bearings. In order to turn the rudder, the steering gear has to create a certain torque, or turning effect, and transmit it through the rudder stock. The torque requirement is given by Classification Society rules to ensure safe manoeuvrability of the ship. The factors that affect the torque requirement are the size and shape of the rudder, and the speed of the ship. The rudder arrangement is also exposed to these forces. Fore and aft horizontal forces created by the propeller and waves. Vertical forces caused by the weight of components and ship movement. Horizontal forces on the sides of the rudder when turning. The size of these forces depends upon the size of rudder and also the rudder arrangement. Click the buttons to get more information about different rudder arrangements. Spade rudder Semi-spade rudder Flap rudder This type is the most commonly used rudder for ferries and smaller boats. This type of rudder gives good manoeuvrability depending on the available rudder angle and the rudder profile. This rudder benefits from a clean flow of water. It is held in place only by bearings within the hull. This can create high bending forces in the rudder stock. This type of rudder, sometimes called a semi-balanced rudder, is most commonly used for large ships. This rudder requires less torque, but is not as effective as a spade rudder of the same size. The water flow to the rudder is spoilt by the rudder horn, but the horn allows a pintle bearing to be positioned so as to reduce bending of the rudder stock. This type of rudder is used when good manoeuvrability is required. The rear fin exaggerates the movement of the rudder, making the rudder more effective. The flap is normally operated by a slide mechanism outside the hull using the movement of the main rudder. No extra connection from the steering gear room is required. The torque needed to turn the rudder depends on the size and shape of the rudder and the speed of the ship. Rudders are subjected to fore and aft, horizontal or side forces and vertical forces. Spade rudders give good manoeuvrability and are used for ferries and smaller ships. Semi-spade rudders need less torque and are used for large ships. Flap rudders can be used where very good manoeuvrability is needed. Here is a reminder of what we have covered in this chapter. Move the mouse over the slides if you would like a reminder of the main points. By the end of this chapter, you should be able to identify the working parts of rotary vane and ram type steering gears. Recognize that rotary vane type steering gears can have an integral rudder carrier bearing or a separate rudder carrier bearing. Recognize that ram type steering gears always use a separate rudder carrier bearing.
state what allowance is made for vertical movement and wear of the rudder carrier bearing in ram-type steering gears. For the ram type, the actuator is installed in the steering gear compartment directly above the rudder. The rudder stock connects the rudder with the rudder tiller and the rudder tiller connects the rudder stock to the actuator. On the rotary vane type, the actuator is situated on top of the rudder stock in the steering gear compartment. The rotor in the rotary vane actuator is mounted directly on the rudder stock. The rudder stock connects the actuator with the rudder. This is the rudder stock. This is the watertight packing gland and rudder carrier bearing fixed to the hull structure. These are the actuator supports. Here is the tiller. The tiller can be fitted to the rudder stock in different ways, such as a tapered hydraulic fit, by key, by bolts, or a combination of these. These are the ram cylinders with pistons. Here are the high-pressure hydraulic pipes. Here are the high-pressure hydraulic pumps with their electric motors. More hydraulic pipes. And finally, the oil reservoirs. The ram-type steering gear system is now complete. The steering gear also has a control system consisting of several hydraulic and electric components, securing safe operation and manoeuvrability of the ship. The steering gear and the control system are supplied with power from the supply panels in the steering gear compartment. Larger ram-type steering gears usually incorporate a device known as a Rapson slide. The purpose of the Rapson slide is to convert the linear motion of the rams into circular motion at the tiller. Each set of two opposing ram cylinders is connected by a guide bar which the crosshead guide swivel blocks slide along. The guide bar ensures that no sideways force is transmitted back to the rams which could cause them to bend and damage the gland packing, leading to leakage of hydraulic fluid. The guide bar can sometimes be designed to include the steering gear stops to limit the maximum travel of the steering gear and rudder, and may sometimes be designed to lock the rudder in position either in an emergency or for maintenance. Smaller ships sometimes use floating rams, which have ball joints at each end to operate the tiller. The ball joints are needed because the positions of the rams will change as the tiller rotates. On very small ships, only one double-acting ram, or two single-acting rams, may be used to steer the ship. The design allows more freedom in layout. The main problem is that the hydraulic connections to the rams must also be flexible. This usually means the use of flexible hoses. These do not last as long as the solid pipes used with rams using a Rapson slide. It is also necessary to ensure that the rams are not bent or deflected by any vertical forces, so ram-type steering gears always need a separate rudder carrier bearing to support the weight of the rudder. The carrier bearing is usually designed to take up at least some of the radial load from the rudder stock, in addition to the weight of the rudder, and therefore has both radial and horizontal bearing surfaces. The alignment of the rudder stock is sometimes assisted by using a bearing surface which is conical in shape. With modern bearing materials, there should be very little wear on the rudder carrier bearing. If the carrier bearing does wear, however, then the rudder and rudder stock move downwards, so there must be enough clearance between the bottom of the tiller and the bearings in the wraps and slide to avoid the weight of the rudder being taken by the rams, which would bend the ends of the rams downwards and lead to leakage of hydraulic fluid. The wear-down clearance of the carrier bearing is important, and needs to be checked in dry dock, and measuring gauges are sometimes provided with the steering gear for this purpose. There is also clearance at the top of the wraps and slide arrangement, 
so that if the rudder should be lifted by wave action in heavy weather, its upward movement will be stopped by its clearance to the hull before exceeding the clearance to the rapson slide, sometimes referred to as the jumping clearance. It should also be checked during dry dock. This is the rudder stock. It is tapered on top to fit the rotor. This is the rotor. It is usually mounted to the rudder stock by the use of a tapered hydraulic fit, but different ways, such as a key, bolts, or a combination of these may be used. These are the bearings for the rotor, upper and lower radial bearing, and the rudder carrier. This is the actuator housing. These are the stopper mounting bars. These are the stoppers, which serve a dual purpose. Together with the rotor vanes, the stoppers divide the actuator into pressure chambers and also make boundaries for the maximum rudder angle. This is the lower packing gland. This is the base for the actuator. This cover forms the top of the pressure chambers. This is the ring jack. It is used during installation to force the rotor onto the rudder stock. This is the rudder stock nut. This is the mounting plate for the angle indicator. This is the angle indicator shaft. This is the system oil expansion tank. This is the angle indicator wheel. These nuts lock down the cover stoppers and oil gasket. With these, the actuator is complete. Please be aware that the actual sequence for assembling the actuator is different from the sequence shown here. For rotary vane type steering gears, the actuator is usually connected to the rudder stock, while for ram types, the rudder stock is connected to the tiller. The typical layout of a ram type steering gear. A separate rudder carrier bearing is used with ram type steering gears. The rotary vane steering gear usually has integral rudder carrier and radial bearings. Here is a reminder of what we have covered in this chapter. Move the mouse over the slides if you would like a reminder of the main points. If you're not sure of anything, you can go back over it again. Once you're ready, Move on to the next page for an end of chapter assessment.